All right, guys, two more chapters. This is chapter 14, The Work Begins. Hudson Taylor. Um, the Work Begins. The new missionaries of China Inland Mission did not have to wait long for God to answer their prayers for accommodation. The first missionary to come aboard the La Mumu to welcome them to China was William Gamble of the American Presbyterian Mission. William Gamble had been living in Ningpo at the same time as Hudson, and they had become friends. Now he was excited to welcome his old friend back to China. William Gamble was the printer for the American Presbyterian Mission, and he had recently moved from Ningpo to Shanghai to set up new printing press. He had bought a large warehouse close to the old city to the house to house the new press, but the printing equipment had been delayed, so his warehouse stood empty. When he found out the new missionaries had nowhere to stay, he insisted that they use his warehouse for as long as they liked while they arranged the permits they needed to move inland. The warehouse would be more than big enough for all of them and their equipment and supplies. The next day, the group joyfully unloaded their belongings from the La Mumure and moved into the warehouse. After drying out their wet belongings and washing all of their clothes and bedding, it was time for them to get down to business. Hudson hired a barber who shaved the front of each man's head and wove a false cue into the hair that was left. Next, the group were all outfitted with Chinese clothes. As they emerged from the warehouse onto the street, a collection of both foreigners and Chinese stopped to look and laugh. The men in particular had a difficult time keeping their pants pulled up and not tripping over the curled up ends of their new shoes. There was even an article in Shanghai newspaper about the new China Inland Mission. In the article, the writer called them the Pigtail Mission. Mm. <laughs> Too many it's foreigners in Shanghai. Fun. The behavior of new mission was both un-British and un-Christian. Missionaries from other organizations often crossed the street when they saw someone from China Inland Mission approaching. They wanted nothing to do with such a weird group of people. Well, that doesn't sound like a Christian thing to do. What do you think? All of this caused some of the new missionaries to wonder whether wearing Chinese clothing and having a Chinese hairstyle was the right approach. I think the Chinese clothing is fine, but maybe the hairdo is extreme. <laughs> hairdo or hair don't? Mm. To do or not to do? Yeah. To hairdo or to... Or not. Or to not hairdo? Or not to hairdo. Or to not hairdo? Whatever. To do... To hairdo or to not hairdo? Mom, do the same as your face. <laughs> okay. Um, do you want to be remembered for the strange Western clothes you wore for, or for the message of salvation you preached? He asked them. The new missionaries could see his point and spent more time practicing how to roll up the sleeves to their tunics and eat rice with chopsticks. I think that's important, though. You should be able to be able to eat with chopsticks. Three weeks Wait, after arriving, the paperwork it, like, was complete, grain. and Ooh. China Inland Mission had per permission to leave Shanghai for Hangzhou. Hangzhou. Before they left, several missionaries from other groups came to talk to Hudson. They told him he was crazy. How could you encourage nine unmarried women to venture into the interior? Didn't he know that in all of China, there was not one unmarried woman to venture into the interior? Didn't he know that in all of China, there was not one unmarried woman working away from the five treaty ports? Hudson did know, and as they spoke, he thought back to Brighton Bridge, Beach, and all God had shown him there. He would do all he could to keep the women safe, but God had called them, and each woman knew the risks involved. William Gamble had grown attached to the missionaries staying in his warehouse. He was sad to see them go, and he did not want them want to take the rent money they insisted on paying him he came to the dock to see them off it was beautiful moonlit night when they boarded the junks that would take them 100 miles up the huang pu <laughs> river to hang chow <laughs> william gamble gamble helped them aboard and without waving goodbye he left a small package on the seat of the last junk when the package was opened, it contained all the rent money they had paid him for use of the warehouse and a note that read, For the good of the mission. The junks floated silently out 
and onto the river past the docks where the Lammermuir was still tied up undergoing repairs. The crew had been looking out for the missionaries and when they saw them, they begged Hudson to come aboard for one last service. By the light of the moon, the missionaries clambered up the rope ladder over the side of the ship onto the familiar deck of the Lammermuir. Hudson preached a short sermon on the foredeck and they sang some hymns together. Mr. Brunton asked if he could travel upstream with the party for a few days, and Captain Bell gave his permission. So, with one more member than what they had started, the group reboarded their junks. As they floated out on the river, the crew and the missionaries sang together, Yes, we part, but not forever. The same hymn that had annoyed so many of the crew when the, they first heard it on the East India Company dock in London. Now they themselves were singing as as loud as they could, not caring what the sailors on nearby ships thought. Mr. Brunton traveled with them for three days, and Hudson baptized him in the river before he returned to the Lam Rumer in Shanghai. The trip to Hangzhou was very slow, and it was four weeks before the junks finally docked there. The city of a million people was, a be was as beautiful as Hudson had told everyone it would be. Although heavily damaged, during the Taiping Rebellion, it had been mostly rebuilt and there were lots of lakes and open fields in and around the city. Just as in Shanghai, there were few houses to rent in Hangzhou, but after several days, Hudson managed to find the perfect place, that is, if you used a lot of imagination. The house at number one, New Lane, was one of those buildings that had not been repaired after the Taiping Rebellion. It had enormous holes in its walls, and what was left of the walls was caked with mud. But the house was also huge. It was a two-story building and had over 30 rooms. Hudson could immediately see the possibilities. There would be a hospital and a dispensary downstairs and living space upstairs. The house also had a courtyard and a beautiful rock garden and pond where the children could play safely. The team set about quietly repairing the house. They knew most of the people in the city had never seen a foreigner before, and they didn't want to scare them. So they left the windows open and curtains undrawn Mom, most of the time the so their neighbors could see what they were doing. Soon they had little groups of Chinese people watching them eat rice and vegetables with chopsticks and swat the flies away with large grass fans. <laughs> Slowly the people peering in through the windows got braver. You just made this video like five seconds longer, you know. <laughs> um, they hung around the doorway and finally ventured inside. One or two curious people opened up a sea chest to see what was kept inside. They turned the handle on the clothes ringer and pretended to feed clothes through it like the foreign women did. A few of the braver ones examined the woman's long hair, which came in strange colors. White like a silkworm's thread or brown like hemp rope. They looked into the foreigner's blue and gray eyes <laughs> and they laughed at their long, bumpy noses. They rubbed freckles. Oh. You have some freckles? That'd be different. I don't have any freckles. They rubbed freckles to see if they were painted on and came to the conclusion that although the foreigners had some unfortunate deformities, <laughs> they were not all that different from themselves. News of the friendly foreigners spread through the city. Before long, the house on New Lane was a hive of activity. The hospital opened, and soon over 200 patients a day were coming to receive medical care. Mm. Sui, one of the converts from the Bridge Street Church in Ningpo, joined the team. He spent his days preaching and talking to the crowds that came to the house. After particularly difficult operations to remove cataracts, for example, Hudson would take a break by singing hymns and playing the harmonium. The patients loved it. Hudson would sing at the top of his voice and then climb to the top of the desk and preach his heart out. Life was never dull at the house on New Lane. Um, he would stand on his desk and preach. Cool. <laughs> Maria often sat with the patients, praying with those who seemed frightened and telling Bible stories to the children. She also had another baby of her own to look after. Little Maria was the baby sister Grace had wanted for so long. In late summer, the Taylor family took much needed break. Maria and the five children Grace, 
Herbert Howard Samuel and now little Maria stayed in the mountains outside little the city while Hudson divided his time between there and the work in Hang Chow. The children found new energy to climb and explore away from the heat of the city. They ran and swam all day long, wearing themselves out by nightfall. Is this washed? No. Parsley. Mm. Um, but one morning, about a week into their stay in the mountains, Grace did not want to get out of bed. Maria brought her food, but Grace was not hungry. As the day wore on, Maria became very concerned, so she sent for Hudson. By the time he arrived, Grace's temperature was soaring. He examined her carefully. Then he quietly slipped out of the room and motioned for Maria to follow him. He walked silently down to the pond where the children liked to swim. Then he spoke to Maria in a halting voice. There is no hope of Grace getting better. She has meningitis, and there is no cure. Someone stayed with Grace every minute, wiping her brow, singing to her, and praying for her. Five days later, while Hudson and Maria, many of those who had been with them on the Lammermere, gathered round her bed and sang hymns. <sighs> Grace died peacefully. That's rough. Hudson missed her terribly. He cried for days. Everything he did and saw reminded him of Grace. He walked past the lake and saw the swans. They liked to feed together. He looked out his surgery window and saw the little swing in the courtyard that she had asked him to make for her. It now hung still. But the work in Hang Chow went on, and while there was sorrow, there was also joy. William Rudland and Mary Bell were married. Wang Lei Jian, who had accompanied Hudson and Maria to England seven years before, joined them. Pastor Wang, as he was now called, started a small church. Soon it had 50 baptized believers. The church was active in reaching out to the rest of the community with the gospel message. Four other mission stations were also opened in nearby cities, and the China Inland Mission was beginning to grow as new missionaries arrived from England. There was still so many other challenges in China, though Ann Hudson was getting restless. He had been in Hangzhou for nearly two years, and it was time for him to move farther inland. Jenny Falding and the McCarthys, who had me, joined the team in Hangzhou from England, agreed to stay and support Wang Lao Jun, while the rest of the group packed their belongings once again. In June 1868, they boarded the houseboat headed for Yang Chow, 200 miles farther inland. They sailed up the Grand Canal, crossed the Yangtze River, and then sailed another 12 miles up the canal until they arrived in Hang Chow. Yang Chow, the city Marco Polo had been governor of in 13th century. I didn't know he was governor of anything. Yeah, he was governor. Marco Polo is an amazing story. I love that man's story. One minute. One minute. And do you know, he would have never have written any of his tales down, but he was put in jail. So he had nothing else to do except write his book. Go ahead. Yep, another five seconds. Um, Marco Polo had been governor in the 13th century there. Like Chung Chow, when which Hudson had visited 13 years before with John Burdon. Yang Chow was known was no for the unruly. I think they're missing an N. Editing problem. Yang Chow was known for the unruly behavior of its inhabitants. Is it Cone? Right here. That's the second typo this I found. no... Aware of this, the members of the China Inland Mission stayed quietly on their houseboat until late July when they moved into a large house Hudson had rented. The house was close to several other houses and had a number of outbuildings for team members to live in. Hudson hired some carpenters who spent several weeks working to repair and improve the house so that the team would be able to make better use of it for their ministry. Few foreigners had ventured into Yang Chow, and so the team were very cautious as they made contact with local inhabitants. A number of the educated people in the city were not happy to see the foreign missionaries. They believed that the foreigners would undermine their Confucianist beliefs, so they began spreading rumors about the group. 
saying they ate babies and gouged out the eyes of dying people. The locals believed what they heard and what they read on the posters that appeared around the city, listing all the disgusting practices the foreigners engaged in. People began to gather outside the China Inland Mission House and chant and jeer at those inside. At first, there had been a hundred protesters, but each night there were more. Finally, on Saturday night, August 22nd, 1868, they were nearly 10,000. That's a lot. That's like bigger than the town of Del Rapids or like bigger than the town of Marion. I mean, 10,000 people. That's a lot. Um, Probably bigger than Sioux That's more people than go to my church. We have a, you have a teeny tiny church, Mom. Like, I know. Like, so the chanting of the mob filled the house. The foreign devils have eaten 24 children. The foreign devils have eaten 24 children, the mob screamed. Rocks and mud balls exploded against the courtyard walls, and angry people pushed at the gate, which was chained shut. There must be at least 8,000 of them, Hudson said to Maria, and every one of them thinks we want to eat their children. No wonder they're hung hungry. Oh, I mean angry. <laughs> Maria nodded. Herbert, Howard, Samuel, and little Maria were huddled around their mother, who was holding their newest baby, Charles. The Charles. missionaries quickly began her. barricading themselves in the house. They nailed the shutters closed and piled tables and other furniture in the front of the door. Hudson then gathered them all together. In addition to Maria and himself and their five children, there were three men and five women from China Inland Mission, as well as 19 Chinese Christians in the house. The crowd is very angry. I don't think they'll stop until they have revenge, said Hudson. This is Wait, the Grace hostile mobs they faced. Was Grace the oldest child? I, I, no, she was the old, only oldest girl. The oldest girl. William Rudland and Henry she Reed nodded. Some of the earlier crowds had been ugly, but nothing like this. Our best hope, Hudson went on, is to get to the Mandarin quickly and ask him for help. He is the only one who can stop this. I'll go, volunteered George Duncan. Me too, said William Rudlin. No, said Hudson. The Mandarin knows me. He knows I am the leader of the mission. I must go. George will come with me. William, you stay here and help Henry to protect the others. Hudson kissed Maria and the children goodbye and with George Duncan slipped out into the courtyard and disappeared through the neighbor's house. They walked quickly once they reached the street that backed into their house. If they kept their heads down and did not run, maybe they wouldn't be recognized. But some of the mob caught sight of them, even in their Chinese dress and cues, as they rounded a corner. As the mob began to call after them, Hudson and George Duncan looked at each other, then began to ran, run for their lives. I would have just started like praying scripture and saying, No weapon formed against me shall prosper in the name of Jesus. Or like, call down angel armies. Angel armies, come quick! Um, that's what I would do. That's my game plan. If an angry Chinese mob comes against me, I'm calling down those angel armies. Hey, yo, my personal angel army fam. Yeah. Are you going to come down? All right. So <laughs> they started running for their lives, literally. Fortunately, it was getting dark, and Hudson knew a shortcut through some fields. After a while, the men looked behind them. No one was following they ran on, knowing that the crowd would guess they were headed for the Mandarin's house. Dun, dun, dun. In the, if the crowd got to his gate first, they would have no hope of getting in to see him. They rounded a corner, and there was the gate to the Mandarin's house, about 30 feet in front of them. But racing from the other direction was the mob, knives drawn and yelling at the top of their voice, voices. It was too late for Hudson and George Duncan to turn back. They had to get to the gate first. Faster and faster they ran, getting closer to the gate and to the mob. As the mob was about to grab them, they pushed the gate open and fell into the Mandarin's courtyard. But they had to act quickly. The Mandarin had to know they were in his courtyard and under his protection. Save life! Save life! Hudson yelled at the top of his voice as he regained his balance and rushed toward the house. Save life! were the only two words a Mandarin had to respond to. And quickly, the Mandarin secretary came running out to see what the commotion was. The mob drew back when they saw him. They had lost the opportunity to get their hands on the foreign devils, who were under the Mandarin's protection now. 
The secretary invited the two men inside and asked them to wait. The China Inland Mission House was a mile away, and as they waited, Hudson and George Duncan could hear the thousands of people yelling and chanting outside the house. It was impossible to imagine what might be happening to those inside. Kind of like the angry mob that stormed the Beast's castle in Beauty and the Beast. That's what I'm imagining, but worse. Um, they prayed at heart, as hard as they could while they waited for the Mandarin. Back at the house, the women and children had been sent upstairs while the men stayed below to keep the barricades in place. As soon as they could, there was a rhythmic slamming against the front door until finally a hammer smashed through it and the table was propped against it. The men looked around desperately for something to reinforce the barricade, but there was nothing. The barricades would be completely down in a few more seconds, and William Rudland ran for the stairs. He had to warn the women, even though there was no way out for the, from the second floor. Henry Reed fled into the garden. About this time, the Mandarin finally agreed to see Hudson and George Duncan. After greeting each other, Hudson, fluent in Mandarin dialect, explained that their house was under siege and that many foreign lives were in danger. The Mandarin nodded and frowned. Hmm, I wonder why, he asked. Because all sorts of false rumors have been spread over Yang Chao. This morning, a new poster said we ate babies, replied Hudson. And what do you really do with the babies you capture? Where are they now? Are you going to take any more? Asked the Mandarin politely. Hudson was shocked by his questions. The Mandarin believed the lies as well? Hudson tried to stay calm. We have come here to help the babies, not to hurt them. I'm sure you will not find one baby missing in the whole of Yang Chao, but it would be a pity to find that out after we are all dead. Yes, agreed the Mandarin, but why would the crowd be rioting if there were no reason to do so? Hudson bit his lip in frustration. They have been told some incorrect things. May I suggest that first you quiet the crowd and then continue the questions? Hudson spoke as earnestly as the fourth, as forthrightly as he could. Yes, yes. That is a good solution to the problem. You stay here out of sight and I will see what can be done, said the Mandarin as he left the room. Once again, Hudson and George Duncan were left alone to wait. They could still hear the shouting and banging in the background. They prayed and waited and prayed some more. An hour went by. They began to wonder if the Mandarin might not be just drinking tea in the next room. Mm waiting for the crowd to kill everyone before coming back to tell them he got there too late. Another hour went by. Now the noise of the riot had finally died down. Hudson and George Duncan wondered why. More time passed. Finally, the Mandarin walked back into the room. Everything is quiet now, he said. The city's military governor and soldiers have been to your home. They have made some arrests, mainly the people looting your property. They will be punished. You may return home now. I will send an escort to see you safely there, and I will post guards at your gate tonight. Hudson's heart sank. If people had been looting the house, that meant the barricades had given way. If the mob had managed to get inside, what happened to Maria and the children and the other missionaries? When they finally reached the house, Hudson could see smoke rising from it. The two men kicked their way through the wreckage. Books were ripped apart and scattered across the floor. One wall had been burned and sacks of rice had been split open and dumped everywhere. The furniture was smashed, but there was no people or bodies in the house. A new convert who had been in the house came running in. Come here, come here, he said, gesturing for them to follow. Hudson and George Duncan ran out after them. He led them through the courtyard and into the neighbor's home. In an inner courtyard of the house, they found everyone safe. Hudson cried with relief when he saw them. They told him their tale of escape. When the barricades had been breached, William Rudlin had ran upstairs to warn the women while Henry Reed had fled into the garden. The women and William Rudlin were trapped upstairs. Their only escape was to jump 15 feet down into the courtyard below. They threw down pillows and quilts to break their fall. As each person jumped, Henry Reed hid them in the well house at the back of the garden. Before they had all managed to jump to safety, some men had rushed upstairs. They robbed the women of their valuables, and when William Rudland refused to hand over his watch, one of the men picked up a brick to smash his head. Maria threw her arms between the man and William Rudland, so the man had turned to strike her with the brick. Would you hurt a defenseless woman? She asked the man. The man was surprised by the question, dropped the brick, and ran to the door. Come up, 
Come up, he yelled to the mob below. William Rudland and the remaining women used the opportunity to jump to safety. Unfortunately, the mob downstairs had set the pillows and quilts on fire. Henry Reed pulled them away, but now there was nothing to break their fall. Maria landed hard and twisted and cut her leg. Emily Blatchley fell backwards as she hit the ground and shattered her elbow. Battered and bruised, they were all safe, and a neighbor gave them refuge in his inner courtyard. Later that night, they all returned to the China Inland Mission House. The rooms had been looted. Drawers were emptied out. Windows were smashed, and the furniture was demolished. Amazingly, though, Emily Blatchley's room was untouched. More amazingly, it was the room where most of the mission records, important papers, and money were kept. The next day, the Mandarin sent out a proclamation warning the people of Yangchow not to disturb the missionaries again. It ended with the words, If anything like this occurs again, the offenders will be severely punished. Disobey not. The proclamation was posted on every street corner. A week after the riot, things were back to normal in the city. The missionaries repaired the house and the ministry in Yangchow continued and became fruitful. Praise the Lord. Wait.